Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for today, who is Tony Visaki, who is an old, old, old friend of mine. Uh, we first met in 1983 when he and his wife moved across the street from us. And my wife and I were looking out the living room window, watching them trying to back into the driveway. Now, their driveway had down the middle of it these um, uh, concrete barriers that the their next door neighbor had put up uh, to uh, to delimitate the uh, whose side of the driveway was whose. And it would let, let's put it this way. You had to be um, a pro to be able to back in with those there. But by the way, eventually they became friends with the neighbor and got them removed. <laughs> uh, but Tony, Tony has led an interesting life. He was a priest who um, went uh, with the White Fathers to Africa and was in Uganda and other areas of Africa. Uh, he then um, became laicized and left the priesthood, uh, married and uh, moved to Summit and worked for AT&T. And after that, he actually went and uh, went back to work for the uh, missionaries and was traveling to Africa to, um, to, to, to update and, and get the, um, the status and uh, uh, just, just to renew their, their, uh, their uh, uh, targets and anticipation of what was gonna go on there. Uh, he also, uh, uh, in retirement, decided to uh, get his master's in foreign affairs, uh, which he did uh, from Seton Hall University. And uh, he has uh, also been my sponsor for uh, the Summit Old Guard, uh, for those of you who may not know it. Anyway, with no further ado, I give you Tony Visaki. I don't know how long I'll stay behind the microphone because I'm when I'm talking, I flay my arms around from part of my Italian background. And uh, the Scots in me is uh, that I eat oatmeal in the morning with salt. <laughs> so George explained how I got, got to Africa, how a guy from uh, the east coast of Fife in Scotland ended up in Uganda. I went to Uganda for the first time in 1965, spent eight years in the same place. You might say, um, I don't know if they're going to do it, but uh, the, later on, the, the, instead of looking at my ugly face, you'll see pictures of a recent trip we, my wife and I made to Uganda. Um, first of all, Let's look at Africa. Slide one. Okay. Africa is not a country. It's a continent. And there are 59 countries in Africa. The, this is southern Sudan. It's just the... <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so southern Sudan, which is the between Sudan and Uganda, uh, is the latest country. And since its inauguration, uh, since its independence from Sudan itself, it has been constantly in conflict. The two major tribes there are the Dinka and the Nur, and they have traditionally been at each other's throats. But the good thing for southern Sudan, it is a very wealthy country in terms of um, oil, diamonds, 
And what else do you have? And that's why the Sudanese res resisted breaking it off from their own country. And they have been at war with, North, with Sudan for, since 1958. How big is Africa? Okay, there you are. Isn't that huge? You've got the USA fits there, China, India, uh, and all the other countries, the European countries across the top. It is a vast, vast continent. Just to get to the middle of Africa, when I used to fly from Amsterdam, would take eight and a half hours just to get to the middle of Africa. Let that sink in a little bit. Okay, European um, activities into Africa. They started very early. Of course, the countries along the top, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, are part of the Arabic Maghreb. And Maghreb in Arabic means West. So those countries had a constant flow of um, relations, trade, etc. Further around Africa, in the 15th century, Vasco da Gama sailed to yeah, Vasco da Gama sailed into the Congo and established a mission there in the Congo, which flourished for a, a long time, for a couple of centuries. They had priests, they had bishops, they introduced all sorts of skills. And the other thing they introduced was the sweet potato, because the Portuguese, of course, Brazil had having been their large colony, when the sailors came to the Congo, they introduced the sweet potato, and that has flourished all over Africa. Wherever you go, you can always find sweet potatoes or yams, same thing. Further European, um, further external influences to Africa were the Chinese. In the 16th century, a large armada of Chinese ships arrived on the east coast near to Mogadishu or Kenya. They never went on land because they were recalled by the reigning emperor in China. So they didn't, they didn't have any impact on the country until 400 years later. In the middle of the 18th century, uh, sorry, in the middle of the 19th century, interest in Africa peaked. And it was mainly because of a man called David Livingston, who was a doctor and a missionary. And he said, in one of, after his first mission to Africa, when he came back to London, he said, we must introduce, now this is what he said, civilization, Christianity, and commerce with Africa. He went back to Africa and was almost lost until the Daily Telegraph hired and um, what's his name, Morton, Henry Morton, to go and look for him. Now, Morton was at the same time an absolute monster. He was an Englishman, and he, but it, it, to say this for him, he was the first person to travel on foot from, West, from East Africa to West Africa, along the way creating hideous um, crimes, like chopping people's hands off if they, if they were um, found stealing. Then came the Brits. The British became, again, because of Livingston, the British came to East Africa. And people like Burton, Richard Burton, and Henry Speak, John, Henry, John Harrington Speak, their aim was to come in and look for the source of the Nile. And this was a big uh, sort of um, desire to find where the Nile rose, one of the longest um, rivers in the world. I think it's the third. Um, so they arrived in Tanzania, 
in Tabul in the um, blah, blah 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 Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam means the house of peace, and they walked in. I've got all these people were walking, and they had perhaps a hundred carriers for um, for all their baggage. They had to bring everything with them. They had to bring paper. They had to bring ink. They had to bring pens. And they had chronometers, which measured how far, how many miles they had come every day. Now, Burton and Speak um, fell out. Burton wanted to stay. Burton, by the way, was the first Caucasian to go to Mecca and discover what was on in Mecca. He was a polymath, knew several languages, including Arabic, and was determined to stay and learn Swahili in Tanzania. But um, Speak decided to go north to discover the source of the Nile. He came to Lake Victoria. I'll show you Lake Victoria. Right here. Lake Victoria is larger than Ireland. It's a, a huge body of sea. Unfortunately, recently, then somehow or other, a wild species of hyacinth has started to grow around the edges of it, and it's causing a tremendous uh, impact on the fishing in v Lake Victoria. So, speak when Speak and Burton, well, actually, Burton returned to England before Speak. Speak came to um, England. But Burton had denigrated so much of his findings and his writings that the two became enemies. Speak, however, with his friend Grant, decided to find out, is this the source of the Nile? And to do that, he had to return, rent canoes, and go around the entire border of Lake Victoria. There he discovered the Karuma Falls, and that was truly the source of the White Nile, because there are two Niles, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile rises in Ethiopia, of what is today Ethiopia. And the White Nile is, goes all the way from uh, Lake Victoria up through Cairo and Alexandria, where it splits up into the, the Delta and into the Mediterranean. On the other side of Africa, the French started to get very interested. Of course, the person who got most interested in it was Leopold I, who claimed the Congo. Uh, the Congo is 80 times larger than Belgium, of which uh, Leopold was the king. Well, under Leopold, he suggested that the European nations get together to mark out spheres of influence so they wouldn't clash against one another. And in 1875, at the, um, at the Conference of Berlin, which Leopold had a very strong um, desire to see this go ahead, but the person who worked the, the sort of then chairman of the, the conference was Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor of Prussia. There, they settle who goes where. The French took much of West Africa, the British much of East Africa. However, there was one man, a, a real colonialist, Cecil Rhodes. He wanted Africa to be red from Cape Town to Cairo. And when he meant red, he meant that would be ruled by Britain and her Britannic Majesty. <laughs> Great. Um, I think recently there has been a movement to remove uh, Cecil Rhodes's statue in Oxford University. I remember a Rhodes Scholar. Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. He provided the money for non-Brits to come to study in uh, England and cement relations. So where was, yeah. So they divided the thing up. As I said, the French in the West, 
the British mainly in the East, of course, um, the Belgians in the Congo, and the, the um, what's it's the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique, and the Southern Africa was left to because a number of a, a lot of um, settlers in South Africa. Uh, and so that worked. It worked to a certain extent. The results of colonialism, there are two results for colonialism. Number one, it settled the countries. Ever since independence and starting in back in the 60s, up until now, no African country has claimed that we want to change our borders although it would be a good idea that some of the borders would be changed. Take Uganda, for example, here in pink. The Nile goes through, not only rises in Uganda, but passes through Uganda. On the West Bank of the Nile, it created a region called West Nile. And West Nile was occupied by the Alur tribe, the same tribe as was in over the border in the Congo. So that was one of the effects of colonialism. They didn't care about boundaries. They didn't care who the people were. They just created their maps and to hell with it. If we take, for example, three countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Oh, by the way, after the, I should have mentioned this, both Bismarck and the British, bizarrely enough, didn't want to have colonies. The British thought, uh, we've got India on our backs and that's enough for us. Bismarck, of course at that time, Germany didn't exist and his main job was to unify Germany under the Kaiser of Berlin. So he didn't want colonies either. But in the end, they both submitted to taking to setting up colonies in Africa. And the Germans had the colonies was Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, and across in what's now called Benin. And so this is how they, they started. Now, let's take the case of Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. After the First World War, Germany was stripped of its colonies. And they were handed out by the League of Nations to other countries. Leopold was desperate to get Tanzania so that he could have a block all over um, Africa. Uh, didn't happen because the League of Nations gave Tanzania to the British. Now, Kenya was a colony. That meant that whites were allowed to come in and establish themselves, steal the land from, uh, from the Africans and build their own massive um, tea plantations, coffee plantations. And that hasn't changed because when the colonial government was kicked out in 1963, the African governments came in and they left everything that the colonials had established. So the land didn't go back to the Africans. That was a true colony. Uganda called itself a protectorate. It did not allow Europeans to settle in Uganda, but it did allow it, the Indians to come because they helped build the railroad from Mombasa and to Nairobi and then on to Kampala in Uganda. So the British by this thing called it Uganda a protectorate, which was a fancy word for a colony. And then came Tanzania. Now the League of Nations had decided that of Tanzania must be hooked up with some European country. And they chose Britain to take over Tanzania. 
The Belgians, who went to Tanzania, had to finish up with Rwanda and Burundi, those two tiny countries right in the middle of Africa, which you really pulled their weight. So that set up. Then came independence. Now, the Chinese have had a long history in Africa. Not just the, the, the armada that came in from Beijing or wherever, but they also were very sympathetic to the independence movements in various countries. They offered scholarships for Africans to go to Beijing or other universities in China to study. They built what's called the Tanzan Railroad in the 1960s. The Tanzan Railroad went from Dar es Salaam into what was at that time, or still is, is Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, into the copper mines. Unfortunately, the, the workmanship was rather shoddy and the rail line failed. Now they're starting to build more, more railroads from especially from um, Mombasa, Nairobi, and Uganda. It was um, remarkable when I was in Rwanda once, the first time I went to Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is a very mountainous country, and the roads sort of wave around the mountain signs, and it can be quite dangerous because you don't know what's coming in the other side. Uh, could be someone driving a truck driving on the wrong side of the road. But when you turn one corner and you look up, you see six white stones. Been there since the, 19, the early 60s. These were the graves of Chinese who worked to make the roads in Rwanda. So back in the, since the 1960s, China has been very effective in Africa. And now recently, it's become more and more effective, dishing out loans, grants, um, getting the people on their side, the nations on their side, so they'll vote with them in things like the United Nations. How will they repay these loans? God knows. I think they've got themselves into a real problem trying to uh, help the African, African nations uh, with infrastructure, but these people have got to, the African governments have got to pay them back. And it's already creating a problem for China. And that's my talk. Any questions? About needing uh, <laughs> All righty. Can you tell us about meeting Idi Amin? Shortly after Idi Amin took over the country by um, staging a, a military coup, uh, he decided that he wanted to go around the entire country and visit people and answer questions and possibly kill a few opponents. Uh, he came to our place, uh, seven miles from where we were, in a place called Kagadi, where the British had built a hospital. And we were all lined up, and across came Idi Amin and shook everybody's hands, the, the sort of half dozen people who were being presented to him, shook a hand. So that hand shook that of Idi Amin. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, that's me, wife. And, uh, and this is a very interesting young lady. She, um, and I'll tell you a story about her because it gives you an idea into the, uh, the uh, well, let's say the Bantu. Let me explain what Bantu means. Back in the 1930s, the toxicologists wanted to trace, wanted to sort of clump together different people and the different tribes and countries and ethnic groups and what have you. And they 
saw that a large number of countries, uh, God, a large number of countries used a classification of nouns, the singular and the plural. And sometimes these, these, these can be rather uh, involved. Uh, in Uganda, we had 11 classifications of nouns in the language I spoke. And most of them used the word for a person, muntu. And of course, the plural of that is bantu. So all those countries that had this classification of uh, classification structure for nouns were called bantu peoples. And let's say how they the name struck. Now, what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was telling you about that young lady. She was a lawyer. And this is interesting because um, we've heard of peak population. Well, I just read recently in The Economist that that peak population has reached Africa. Uh, many of my friends of my age have far fewer children than their parents. One in particular has four kids, but she is the, the daughter of a mother who had 10. And you never asked a woman how many children did you have, because that would be revealing something that's not to be revealed. You always asked, what were the names of your children? And then they will rattle off the names, and then they will come to the end, and they'll say so-and-so and so-and-so, so, but they're dead. So these are it's a way of getting into it. Now, this young lady, when she was graduating from Van Drace University, she gave a talk uh, as a valedictorian, and she sort of teared up and said, I wish my father was here. He would appreciate what I've done. Now, knowing her, the person she was referring to was not her biological father. It was her uncle. But there was no distinction between fathers and uncles. And that still lives on today. The nuclear family is not an idea that goes well in African relationships. Because a child can choose his father from among his uncles and become a permanent part of that group. And then, of course, you go up to the clan system and then into the, into the ethnic groups. Now, I hate talking about tribes because I really want to talk mainly, I, I prefer to use the word ethnic group because in every country, and most of the wars in Africa are caused by infighting between ethnic groups. Yeah. Hi. Great talk. Um, there's a book recently out, Colonialism Reassessed, by a British author who has received a lot of negative feedback. His essential thesis is, from a British perspective, okay, that colonialism was a good thing. He says, essentially, on balance, it was good. There's negatives. He cited this issue about Cecil Rhodes being, you know, they want to get rid of his statue, but essentially said Cecil Rhodes was one of the most popular people in Rhodesia among Black officials. So I'm just curious, with all of this, what is your opinion of colonialism? Mixed. Um. I arrived in Uganda just after the country had received its independence. And I heard people saying, quite frankly, I wish the whites were still here. Okay. Um, without colonialism, we wouldn't have had these countries. The boundaries were set by colonialists. And, and the Africans don't want to change them. It remains static, even though um, ethnic groups have been cut in two. And you've got the, the reason I gave it off the Congo. You've got southwestern Uganda, 
where uh, uh, an agreement was signed in 1912 to keep a part of uh, Kenya Rwanda speaking people as part of Uganda and not part of Kenya, not part of Rwanda, which it should be. So one of the things of colonialism was the boundary question. But underneath that, um, and there's another, the person who um, asked the question about the, my views on colonialism, the book that was wrote in favor of colonialism or relatively favor of colonialism was a, a response to another book that had been written by an American woman. Uh, I forget her name, but she outlined all the things that Britain did in Africa. Uganda was conquered by a guy called Lieutenant Colville, who massacred his way. Henry Morton was set out to look after, uh, to look for David Livingston. The man was a monster. Um, a lot of the countries were subdued by force, taken over by force, organized by force. Here's an interesting issue, <laughs> and it made me laugh when I heard about it. The Belgians were condemned for establishing um, obligatory work on the roads. That was in the 1930s. It was condemned as forced la uh, labor. Guess what? A few uh, present uh, president of um, Rwanda, Paul Kagame, instituted a law whereby everybody had to work to keep the roads clean. So what had started under the colonialists was given a new name under the, the independent governments, but it amounted to the same thing. So the effect of colonialism on Africa is mixed. Uh, there were good things to it, and there were certainly bad things to, about it. And by the way, now, we didn't mention the slave trade. One of the big um, connections between Europe and Africa was the slave trade. Because the Brits or the French or the Portuguese would bring guns and ammunition and cloth give them to the rulers on the south coast of particularly Ghana and Nigeria in return for slaves. However, the slaves that were given to the British or the French or the Portuguese were not the peoples from those parts of the country because slavery had been going on for years. And if you take Nigeria, for example, everybody says, oh, Nigeria is split into two. You've got the Muslim North and the Christian South. Not true. Nigeria is split into three. You've got the Muslim North, the Christian South, and you have a band there, uh, which is where there's constant strife between the herders and the farmers. Now, the people in the north would come down to that band, take them, and sell them off to the Arabs. We haven't talked about Arab slavery, but the Arabs were very, very involved in the slave trade, taking people from Africa out to India and um, Arabia and those places. So the, where was that, where was that going? the slave trade. Cloth, guns, ammunition, slaves. Not from their own people, but from people they had captured and were slaves of theirs and taken to the United States, uh, what was then, uh, the States, uh, Caribbean, and particularly Brazil. Uh, but on the other hand, the Arab slavers they would take people from West Africa, walk them to East Africa, chained, and sell them off. And that's 
particular thing. And then when, uh, first of all, France banned slavery. Now, I think you know that, uh, what's his name? When Jefferson went, became um, the diplomat, the ambassador to France uh, from the United States, he took two black people with him. One was Sally Hemming, was his cook, and the other one was his butler. Now, in France at that time, any black person could apply to the local judiciary and say, I want to be free. But those two people knew that, but didn't request to be free, and then returned to the United States with Jefferson. So that was a quirk. But France um, was the first to abolish the slave trade. Then came Britain. France and Britain started to patrol the Atlantic Ocean. And you had stories that um, when the slavers saw a French or, a Euro or an English boat coming, man of war coming towards them, they would throw the slaves who were all chained, they would throw the slaves overboard. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty horrible part of history, both for the United States and for other countries that they were involved in slavery, like Britain, like France. And there you are. Any more questions? Online, Bill Tittle. Yeah, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, uh, a wonderful talk. You obviously love the place, and uh, I'm looking at these pictures and I can understand why you, you do. Uh, but I would say, um, first, uh, uh, America, Americans are probably more ignorant of Africa and perhaps our government officials as well, and, and seem to be overwhelmed by the challenge of taking this Eden and making it into it's such a, a big job. We don't have the, the staying power to do that. And, and therefore, I think the Chinese are going to, you know, whatever problems they have, they're, they're going to be the beneficiaries of making Africa what it becomes. Well, what do you think of that? Um, I think Africans are like us. They have brains, and they can judge what's happening to them. Unfortunately, uh, there's an awful lot of corruption at higher levels in most African countries. Mm. And the Chinese know that. And they are trying. I, I think Africa is just part of their, their attempt to change the world from American-led then system of after World War II to try and create another world system. And Africa is part of that. Mm -hmm. So is Greece. Let's not forget. So will they succeed? The Tanzam Railroad didn't, didn't only stay up for very long. It disappeared under the sand of the country. But Yes, America should be worried because we've seen the size of Africa, the potentiality of Africa. How many of you are wearing smart watches? Uh, <laughs> How many of you have a, a smartphone? Uh, you couldn't have that smartphone without goods coming out of Africa because the biggest uh, Congo is the biggest producer of cobalt in the world and we depend on cobalt for an awful lot of things how many of a Tesla <laughs> okay I, I have a follow-up question um, you know we've been hearing about Chinese um, trying to get a foothold and getting access to minerals and whatnot in African countries but in your talk, you, you said that the Chinese have been coming to Africa for a very long time. So what were they doing before? Were, were they doing something beneficial or were they being colonialists like the, like the Europeans? Or, 
Well, <clears throat> obviously, they didn't set up any countries no, or, I... didn't, or colonies or right. anything. But yes, but there was that gap between the, the Armada coming in the 16th century to the colonial, to the mm. independence movements. The Chinese wanted to get their influence going through the independence movement, and they would bring, as I said, this, uh, lots of Africans to Beijing to study in universities, learn Chinese, and um, return to the, um, their countries. It didn't work. But what, but what was their goal? I mean, what was their interest in Africa? Their interest was, you know, first of all, they, they saw that before us, they saw, for example, the Aswan Dam. When the um, Egyptian government asked the British to build the dam at Aswan, the British said, can't be done. The Russians came in and said, it'll cost so much. And the British said, that's why it can't be done, cost too much. But it was done. The Russians built it. And they have tremendous influence. Now, you've noticed with the Ukraine war, very few African countries are supporting Ukraine. They are afraid of Russia and China and what influence and what they can do to their own countries. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Tony. Just two questions. One is, in the countries that you're familiar with, does the average person identify primarily with his tribe or ethnic group, or do they identify primarily as, as a citizen of their of their country, right? Because um, that goes to eventually what kind of unity or cohesion mm -hmm. these countries are ever mm -hmm. going to achieve. And the second question basically is, what's your sense of either optimism or pessimism for the future of, of these countries? Okay. First of all, um, a little bit of background. There are two types of nationalism. There's ethnic and civic. Now, most African countries, even now, most Africans, even now, prefer their ethnic grouping. So the job of the British or, or the modern governments is trying to get the idea of ethnic nationhood to become civic nationhood. In other words, I'm a Ugandan and not a Munyoro, or a Mutoro, or a Muganda. That is going to be a long process. How long? Well, look at France and Britain, how long it took them to become countries. It was only after the works of, uh, it was only after the War of the Roses in um, the, 15th the end of the 15th century that created Britain. So Britain's only been a country, well, Let's put it this way, England, because uh, don't forget, there's Scotland and Wales. <laughs> it took the Wars of the Roses to create England. Up till then, the country had been masses and masses of little villages and tribes and ethnic groups, and but it gradually began to solidify into two major groups, the Lancastrians and the Yorks, Yorkshire. And they had a major battle, and the winner was Yorkshire with um, Henry VII. Now, remember, that's going back quite a long time. And that moment, England was created in the minds of the aristocracy. What did the ordinary person think? Well, they just carried on life as usual. Take Germany, we talked about Otto von Bismarck. At the end of the, uh, the Thirty Years' War in 1648, what we know as Germany was constituted by 122 statelets, duchies, duchies et cetera, et cetera. And it took them how long to become a unified country? It was only around about the time of World War I. Um, so the effort to make an ethnic, to make a civic nation out of a group of ethnic nations is a long, hard struggle. That's my take on it. Online, Miguel.
<clears throat> Thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I happen to have uh, had the fortune to be in Africa, in South Africa, for the month of uh, de de December and January for my daughter's wedding. And uh, very interesting place. I learned a lot. Um, uh, one thing that I was told is that Bantu was an acronym for the Black African National Tribal Languages, which is sort of similar to what you said, but it was a constructed uh, uh, language. Um, I wanted to mention to everyone that PBS had an excellent uh, series on the history of Africa that goes back 2000 years. And it's a six part series and I recommend it to everyone. I mean, they had great empires and everything. In the West, we only think of the history of Africa in the last maybe 200 years, but uh, there were people living in the Transvaal 600,000 years ago. And uh, they weren't you know, just hanging around doing nothing, they were doing things. Also on the population in India, which is closer to Africa than we are, uh, in South Africa, there were a lot of Indian influence. Uh, they were coming over and Actually, the, the president of uh, the South Af one of the South African countries was uh, Indian. Uh, so India and China both came in and, and it increased in the population, although the Indians were used as laborers in, 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 in Africa, in South Africa, to build, like you said, railroads. Um, one other thing I just wanted to point out, I know I don't have a question, but I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, the slavery... Uh, that we're, we're, of course, naturally sensitive to uh, because it's something that we participated in, but it wasn't an African invention. I mean, the Greeks had slaves, the Romans had slaves, the Vikings had slaves. We're more aware of the Africans because we participated in it, and eventually we stopped it. Uh, so my, my, my question to you is, um, when, when, when you were there, did you uh, uh, feel uh, welcome, unwelcome, or, or how did the people react to you when you were there? Let me respond to that by telling you a story. There was always this question of, do you stop your car at night because somebody's lying on the road? Now, the general issue was, if you saw the person lying in the road, you didn't stop because there would be bandits in the bush. As soon as you stop, come out, batter you, take a car and go off. Now, I was going actually from our mission station to another mission station in, at night. And this subject came up and I said, no, I would never stop. You know, it could be too dangerous. No sooner had I said that than with the head in the headlights, there was a guy lying across the road. And so I pulled up and I heard the rustling in the bushes and I shouted out, you know, come and help me move this guy from the road. And the guy said, oh no, he's a drunkard. I don't want to touch him. I said, come on, help us. I was speaking the local language. When they came out and in the headlights, they saw me and they said, Omukuru, Wibali, Onganyiri, Onganyiri. Father, forgive me, forgive me. And then he helped get the person off the road. We got back in the car. And he said, the guy said, well, that puts, that puts lie, the lie to what you were saying beforehand about not stopping. I said, yeah, but I'm at home here. People know me and people respect me. And yeah, I never felt out of place once. I learned the language. I was given three months to learn the local language and then started my ministry. And I never felt that I was sort of dominating them. But as a missionary who spoke the language, yeah, I was very much a um, person of importance and people came to us. If they hated us, they wouldn't have come to us. And that's it. I felt better. Some people say to me, where would you like to retire? I said, if I had my druthers, I would retire to either southwest Uganda or northwest Rwanda. Why? So first of all, the people are, are wonderful. The climate is fantastic. 
an extremely beautiful place to live. Jim Fagan, online. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, one thing with regard to the comments about the United States, in 2019, uh, the United States set up a development finance corporation, um, which consumed a number of uh, foreign aid agencies and funded it with about $60 billion. Uh, and it is designed basically to compete with China head to head, uh, particularly in Africa. Uh, there's a recognition, lithium, natural resources, things that are vital to the United States interests um, are largely found in Africa. Uh, and it's a, uh, uh, the United States sees it as a competition. I have a friend from Ethiopia, and he said growing up in Ethiopia, he said it was really wonderful because you had the United States on one side, you had the Soviet Union on the other side, and they were competing for influence. And um, the uh, Ethiopia, uh, Soviet Union would say, we'll build you an industrial park. They go to the United States, we'll build you two industrial parks. So I think there is going to be a pretty intense competition. Uh, China's ahead in Africa, but I think the United States is, is certainly setting up a beachhead there. And it's going to provide loan guarantees, debt equity investments, political risk insurance, all sorts of things to encourage um, American companies to go over there. Also, at this time in, um, in Kenya, uh, Google has an operation called Project Kara where they're trying to develop light beam internet, not laying the fiber off the cable, uh, but uh, uh, using uh, light beam internet communications and the implications of that uh, to bring technology and the internet uh, to uh, Kenya and other parts of Africa, I think is something that is um, a, a real possibility. It's somewhat similar to, um, to China. Uh, China basically never had landline uh, phones. They had them, but very, very rare. And uh, the um, uh, the when the and it, I don't know how many decades it took the United States to lay the landlines, but basically China went from no cell phones uh, to, uh, uh, to no phones to cell phones, and they did that in just a matter of years. I think that's a possibility for. Um, uh, for Africa as well. Thank you. I agree. Um, one of the things Africans are good at is playing off one side against the other, and that's what they're doing just now. One of the big things, I think one of the truly remarkable things that America has done was under George Bush with the PEPFAR, which was an attempt to eradicate HIV and malaria in Africa. And, you know, Despite everything, that was a tremendous thing to do, funding. Great talk. Thank, Thank you, you. My pleasure. Uh, and as usual, well, being a member, you know what we <laughs> usually yeah. do. We present you with the, uh, the, uh, the certificate for your presentation today. You. And you, of course, know the, uh, the uh, origin <laughs> and story of the uh, of the um, orchids. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, as a plug for next week, uh, the talk, you will actually hear something about the orchids in okay. Vito's talk next week. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very and much, the Jim. The way, of course, is the old gods. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So.